Well, thanks everybody for uh, those of you that have come back, those of you that are new. We had a nice session this morning. Um, we're going to get ostensibly uh, more policy oriented here in the afternoon. Uh, my name is Jim Henson. For those of you I don't know, I direct the Texas Politics Project at UT Austin. Um, we're here in an event that's co-sponsored with our good friends at the Texas Tribune. Um, this afternoon, we're going to have a conversation about competing priorities facing the 83rd legislature. Uh, I want to thank our, our friends at the Tribune, our staff here from UT Austin, all of you for coming. Uh, just a little bit of housekeeping, if you could uh, silence your cell phones. We've been tweeting pretty much uh, on the piggybacking on the, on the Trib Live hashtag for those of you on Twitter. Um, uh, we'll have a Q&A afterwards. If during the Q&A, um, you could just pause slightly before the, before the question, uh, before you ask your question, and that's not so that we can, you know, we can hear you necessarily, but it helps us to be able to capture your voice on tape. So if you could just, we'll have um, somebody coming around with a microphone, and so if you'll wait, that'd be great. I want to introduce our panelists, and we will get started. Immediately to my left is Albert Hawkins, who was the HHS Executive Commissioner from 2003 into, uh, until 2009. Before his appointment as Health and Human Services Executive Commissioner, he served as a senior White House aide to President George W. Bush for two years. From 1995 to 2000, he was the budget director for the governor's office, uh, worked at the Texas Legislative Board for 16 years, and seems to be enjoying himself now, based on our <laughs> previous com a conversation a moment ago. Next to him is Tom Mason, who served as general manager of the Lower Colorado River Authority from 2007 to 2011. Prior to that, he was the LCRA's general counsel um, before that, he served as the Assistant General Counsel for the Department, uh, Texas Department of Water Resources and Director of the Water Quality Division at the Texas Water Commission. He is now back in private practice, and I think he too is enjoying that. Uh, next to him, uh, Deidre DeLisi is a partner in DeLisi Communication and served as chair of the Texas Transportation Commission from 2008 to 2011. She has, of course, held a wide range of governmental and campaign positions in the service of Governor Rick Perry, including serving as his chief of staff from 2004 to 2007. And now I feel like I don't want to imply that you're not enjoying yourself now. <laughs> All right. And at the end, Robert Scott served as senior policy advisor to Governor Perry during the creation of the Texas High School initiative in 2003, was involved in the bill's passage in, in, in implementation, um, but probably most notably to people in this room, he was the state education commissioner from 2007 to 2012 after playing a variety of roles at TEA, and I know he too is enjoying himself now because he said so out in the hall. Now, um, obviously, as, as you all can, can figure out, we're here to talk really about the issues before, coming before the legislature next time. And we've chosen to talk about the issues that seem to be very much on the minds of folks in this building and in the process. So what we want to do today, even though uh, I'm going to invite everybody to, to comment as as rangely or to what to comment as widely as you'd like, um, we're interested really in talking about issues related to HHS, to water, uh, to transportation, to education, on the expectation that we will be talking about those quite a bit. So please welcome our guests, if you will. Um, all, we designed this panel, basically Evan Ross and I in mind, because we, we thought that all of these areas in which you all have such extensive experience would be ripe for legislative action in the upcoming session. That said, I want to start by pivoting from the election and ask you to comment on how, if at all, you think the federal and state election results will impact discussion of these issues as we begin to pivot into the legislative process. I'd like to start with you, Mr. Hawkins. Well, thank you. Good afternoon. and privilege to be a part of this panel. And I will talk uh, primarily about health and human services, although, you know, I've I, I always been interested in establishing transportation policy or school finance policy. I'll, I'll stay focused this afternoon on health and human services. When you... Uh, Maybe look first at the uh, national elections, and I think there's still probably uh, a lot to be learned more about that and, and uh, how it might change some of the dynamics in Congress. Uh, I think the early, um, the early conclusion can be that, well, not much has probably changed, um, that we still have um, the uh, Democrats controlling uh, the White House and the Senate and the Republicans controlling um, the House. And so 
you might look at it and say with that, that same configuration, why would you expect anything different? Uh, but I do think uh, with these elections, there probably is a little change in the dynamics that take place because of the press of the issues, um, the, uh, the crisis uh, of the fiscal cliff. So I think it will, it will cause some movement and uh, some, some I, I, I think some effort to address um, issues uh, such as entitlements, uh, uh, whether it's Medicare or Medicaid, and uh, those are the kinds of things that would flow, have flow down impact uh, to states, uh, particularly um, Health and Human Services Commission here in this state. Taking a look at uh, the state level uh, elections, again, probably um, not much change in the uh, players, the actors involved. Uh, again, I think it would just be dominated by the issues that they have to confront. One of the things I think that will be interesting to, to, to observe uh, is how the re-election of President Obama might change the uh, view or analysis or expectation in our state around uh, the Affordable Care Act and uh, more particularly the, uh, the opportunity for Medicaid expansion and the uh, opportunity for uh, a health benefit exchange. I, it could be that, um, that now that it's clear that, that the law is gonna move forward uh, with implementation, that there might be a different analysis that maybe is more tilted toward the, uh, fiscal, um, the fiscal impacts of that legislation that the legislature takes a look at. Um, really difficult uh, challenge. Uh, to be addressed, I think. Yeah, I want to follow up on that. We'll do that. Mr. Mason, what do you think? Water? On the waterfront, I don't think that the federal elections uh, are particularly relevant because for the most part, water is a local issue. The only area where it, generally speaking, is relevant is in terms of funding. And until we have a budget surplus at the federal level, I don't think you're going to see a lot of action there. Most of it is going to be on the state level. And I think there's two issues uh, with the recent elections on the state level. One, of course, is funding. We have the same, uh, same issue, limited dollars um, and lots of competing needs. And at the same time, I think there's, what, 49 new members of the legislature. And this morning, I took a look on the Tribune website. They had brief profiles that uh, um, of almost all of them, indicating their, their interests and their priorities. And of the more than 40 that were listed, four mentioned something related to water. And that was it. So my sense is there's not a great deal of concern, at least among the new membership, compared to the other issues they were highlighting. A lot of which, uh, in many cases, was smaller government, uh, cutting taxes, uh, tightening our fiscal belts and so forth which traditionally in the water arena is, is a real challenge because most people think of water projects when they think of water supplies for the future, big projects. And water is not cheap. Um, we assume it will be. Now, you know, this costs um, 2,600 times more than what you'd pay for tap water from the city of Austin, uh, bottled water like this. And yet, to provide water infrastructure, which is the real expense, is extremely costly. And we haven't built a lot of large reservoirs or major pipeline projects in a long, long time. And yet, last year was the hottest summer on record in the driest 12-month period in Texas recorded history. That got a lot of people's attention, but unfortunately, while water specialists talk about the hydrological cycle, uh, the reality is for water planners and water funders and legislators and staffers, we talk about the hydroillogical cycle. <laughs> as long as it's raining, everything is okay. And then it starts getting dry, people get a little bit concerned. When you hit a full-blown drought, people really get upset and they start calling their elected officials and say, you need to do something about this. People do. They look to the state water plan. They actually introduce legislation. They consider fees or uh, or ways to fund new projects, and then guess what happens? It rains again, and you start that cycle over. Uh, the bigger challenge, I think, now with these 49 new members is having them educated on the true cost of water, 
what the state water plan really means and what projects uh, are actually affordable and give the most bang for the buck. Um, the conservation being, I think, the prime example, it accounts for the largest single uh, portion of new water supplies in the state water plan. And yet there's no money allocated for that. It's the cheapest, most economical, fastest way uh, to get new water. Um, but that will be competing with individual projects around the state. And of course, water will be competing with all of these other interests as well. It's the one thing we have to have to live, and yet it's the one thing we probably take the most for granted because we assume someone is going to provide us clean, affordable, cheap water, no matter where we choose to live. All of a sudden, I feel guilty for taking a drink of this. <laughs> well, how about the elections and transportation. I don't, we didn't hear a lot about it during the election. It was a election. huge issue. It was the <laughs> defining issue of the federal election. Um, <clears throat> You know, I think I'm a little, well, first of all, you know, when I think about transportation, I actually think about infrastructure more globally than just transportation. Uh, clearly, I care deeply about transportation, but I think transportation is pretty well linked to water and the electric uh, uh, grid as well, because when you think about those three things together holistically, that is the future for the economic stability and growth of the state. When you think about the limiting factors of the state, it is, I think the number one limiting factor is water and to a lesser extent, our electric grid and our transportation system. Um, and so I'm actually a little bit more bullish on the, on the prospects for infrastructure funding this session um, than maybe some normally are. I mean, yes, I agree that public education, health and human services, those are the issues that garner the immediate attention, uh, tax issues, budget issues. Those were the issues that were talked a lot um, very vocally in the elections. But I do get the sense of a growing recognition among, at the very highest levels of government and among the membership, that we have to do something. Now, of course, the big challenge when you're talking about infrastructure is our crisis is four, six, 20, 50 years down the road. And the challenge for us in infrastructure, I've always argued, is how do we explain to people that there is a problem? And when you're talking about transportation or, infra or water infrastructure, whatever infra infrastructure you're talking about, the solution takes many years to get to. It's not like we need more teachers, so here's more money, go hire more teachers, and you can turn it around fairly quickly. Um, so how we go about articulating that there is a problem and what the solutions could be. Um, and, you know, in transportation, we've been pretty fortunate. We had a governor who took on transportation as an issue, took a lot of political flack for taking on those issues, um, embraced non-traditional sources of, of funding for transportation, innovative financing that have worked well for the state, have made Texas the number one state in the nation for transportation infrastructure. Um, um, you know, I think as long as we continue to embrace those 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 mechanisms, that and and look at some new ways of, of developing transportation and other forms of infrastructure, I, I think we're on the right path. But we have to, like I said, the biggest challenge, one of the bigger challenges, in addition to finding the money, is making sure the public understands there may have to be new ways of delivering these need, needs needed services, and it may be different, and it may be a little bit. Um, scary at first or whatever. It's just not used what they're used to, but we're trying, we have to solve a problem now so that in 20 years we don't get into, we, we don't completely stunt the growth of the state. I want to talk about that a little bit more. Robert, in the, in the last session we, Carolyn Boyle was one of the, on the political side, was one of the people on the panel. And I thought there was a little bit of a disconnect on that panel between the focus that she saw and the centrality she saw of education in the last election and what we were seeing in the polling and what I think we really heard in public discourse that on one hand in some of the electoral contests education was front and center but overall we're not seeing it moving the needle a lot. I'm wondering how you think education you know gets impacted by the election results. Well at the federal level I think a divided Congress and administration seriously compromises the ability to do a reauthorization of No Child Left Behind. That's further complicated by the fact that the U.S. Department of Ed is giving waivers to other states. So the you know, necessity of doing it now, I think, has been uh, severely limited. So uh, you know, from people I talk to, they say that Congress may not get around to it until 2014 or 2015. So. I, I think that's going to be um, one of the, the interesting things for a state like Texas. You know, we'll, we'll probably try to seek a waiver, but do it in a little bit different way, from what I understand. At the state level, you know, I've talked to um, 
editorial boards myself, and you know, as candidates were coming in, they were all talking about education. So I think it's it's pretty high on on the new members' minds, and you know, it's always an issue for the state. It's always Article Two and Article Three are always the big drivers of spending, and I think they'll continue to do that. The challenge facing Texas in going into next session is looking at things like enrollment growth and being able to figure out how to fund the enrollment growth that we have and seeing if we have some additional supports for kids uh, to in implementing the in end of course exams because as what we're starting to see is normally what we saw um, in a subsequent test administration, you'd pick up about 50% of the kids. 50% would pass on the second or third try. We're not seeing that this time. We're seeing failure rates in the 75 to 80% on the second. So I think that there's going to have to be a shift in some resources to provide interventions for those kids. Um, a couple of you have mentioned you know, the, the idea that there are a lot, and I was talking to Tom about this, I think, before we started. There seems to be a little bit of a disconnect when we talk about the, both the physical and the human capital infrastructure issues between what people inside the process are increasingly looking at as something on the edge of crisis and what we're hearing from the electorate. And you, kind of, you touched on this, I think, you know, really well, Deidre. How do, you, how do you think we're gonna manage that in those areas? What, you know, how do you talk to the public about these issues in ways that sustain their attention. Do you have a sense of that? It's a real challenge, I think, uh, particularly when you, when you um, look at some of the more complex policy areas um, that the state has to um, uh, develop uh, solutions around, uh, whether it's school finance or whether it's transportation policy or water policy. You know, it's all very complex. When, when, uh, when you think about Medicaid and the uh, issues uh, that are identified with it, and and just the very nature of Medicaid is is really five different programs. <laughs> uh, but we all talk about it as being the Medicaid program. But the uh, issues stand alone separately. Whether you're talking about long-term uh, services and supports, or acute care, or or care, dental care for children. Um, I, I think uh, one of the things that new members of the legislature. Um, have to uh, deal with very early on in their tenure is the complexity of the issues and the uh, difficulty in um, putting in place uh, effective solutions to address those challenges because of the complex nature, the, uh, uh, the need to balance out uh, the effects of any changes and, and uh, the cost involved. Uh, clearly, you know, dollars um, influence a lot of the, the decisions that are made and, and um, I think they learned very quickly that uh, it's not quite as easy as they thought it was uh, six months ago when they were campaigning for office and, and so they, they get to deal firsthand with some of those real difficult issues. Uh, it's I think uh, also incumbent upon them to better explain to their constituents uh, the challenges that are there. And so when you start talking about uh, educating the public more broadly, there are a number of advocacy groups and, and they're all very familiar with it, but I think it takes the elected representatives to better inform uh, their constituents of the challenges that exist. You know, that, that kind of ties to something you mentioned in your previous answer and I wanted, that I wanted to ask you about. Um, do, you, do you think that the president being reelected in a sense, the settling of the issue of the ACA will, is sufficient to clear the climate in Texas for the kind of discussion you implied before about, you know, a kind of looking at it surely in terms of the numbers of the, the favorable federal match, if you accept that, et cetera. I mean, how, how big a factor is it? You mentioned that kind of in passing. Well, wondering... I, I think it's an important factor just in the sense that uh, it removes an element of doubt around it. Uh, doesn't really um, make more clear the choices that are, that are. I mean, I think those choices have already been self-evident. It doesn't, it doesn't change uh, in that respect the philosophical uh, views that uh, different officials might have on it. What it does do, though, is is take out of consideration the possibility or potential that the law would not move forward. So you have that clearly established. I, I, I would expect uh, that the law is going to move forward. It's going to move forward a different pace and, and different levels in different states. And so I think it's going to be uh, back to the governor and the legislature to determine uh, what is the uh, most appropriate approach for Texas. Uh, but 
the re-election of the president doesn't help resolve those philosophical differences. It does remove um, the uh, consideration of whether Congress or the president would change direction. Tom, what do you think? Are, is it inevitable that we're in the hydrological cycle at, at the state level? You know, we've seen a couple of attempts in a couple of different ways. Kip Abert a couple se sessions ago, um, you know, bills like the TAP fee last time. Is there, can you see that there's a way out of that cycle? I, I think there is, and, and I'm a cynical optimist, but I, I hope it doesn't take an extended drought, which we will have another one in Texas. Uh, we relied upon um, the 1950s drought of record to be our benchmark for, for water planning. And that was a 10-year drought from 1947 to 1957, and it devastated the state economy. Um, but we've gone back and studied tree rings and realized that there have been 30-year droughts in Texas and the Southwest, and it's simply, it's inevitable that at some point we'll have another one such as that. But barring that, um, I'm, I have some optimism because we have folks like uh, Chairman Ritter who, have, uh, who has just repeatedly talked about this issue in very honest and straightforward terms. And more and more members of the legislature, I think, are listening to this and realizing, especially because of last year's drought, that this is real, we have to do something. It's not an easy uh, issue. But there's all, some really particular challenges when it comes to water. Most water issues are very local. Uh, Texas, in a way, is a victim of its geography. East Texas has a lot, we, we have a lot of water in this state. It's just not where most of the people live. And the old joke in, in, in water folks is, you know, water doesn't really flow downhill, it flows towards money. And what that means is ultimately water gets to where the population centers are because people will demand it. And with the tremendous increase in population in Texas, we're getting to the point where formerly adequate resources for rivers and groundwater and, and the existing lakes have been fine, but they're strained now. And if you put a drought on top of that, you have a real problem. But if you're a legislator in East Texas where it's really wet, why do you vote for a water project or a funding source that's statewide when it's going to benefit those people uh, in the West where it's dry. And of course, almost everyone thinks that it's those other people who don't conserve enough water. I do a great job of conservation. Um, and so you have that built-in problem. And yet, I've heard very, very honest conversations from Chairman Ritter and others uh, talking about this issue admitting that it is not going to happen quickly, but we have to get this sort of critical mass of legislators to understand the issue. It is a long-term matter, as Deirdre said. Uh, it's very analogous to, to her other infrastructure issues, and it is the limiting factor, uh, I think, for Texas's growth. I think that may be the way to sell it, absent a really intense drought that goes on for a long time, which is, if we want economic development to continue in Texas, we have to have a reliable water supply for the whole state. Large employers, when they come in, a new industry asks, that's one of the first questions they ask. They want a good educated workforce and, and things like that, but you have to have an adequate water supply. And we're going to have to have a good answer, or else folks up there on the, in the Rust Belt along the Great Lakes are going to say, come on back, we've got lots of water. So I think we can get there. The big question is going to be, what is the funding source, and how do we educate the voters as to why this is really important. And I'm gonna add another note here, which is I think we need to educate people about the fact that water is not free. We've assumed that it is, but the reality is we don't value water very much because it is essentially free. And the most modest tap fee that most people would never recognize, in fact, I bet most people in this room don't even know what their water bill was for last month compared to their cell phone bill or your cable TV bill. So we've come, become accustomed to thinking that water is something that I just get gratis. We've got to change that, and I think we can educate people about how little it would cost to raise sufficient funds to provide adequate water supplies for the future, but we haven't done that yet. You know, I know that what, during your tenure at TechStot, you there was, you know, both in terms of, it seemed to me, both internal dynamics and the Sunset Review, there was a renewed emphasis on, or a, a lot of attention to how tech stock communicated with the public, what the public image of transportation was. How do you view this? 
Well, there's no question that tech thought is a little bit ahead of the power curve on these issues because the, 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 the transportation issues were put on the radar screen and, and put into the public domain in a, such a very public way in the, in the you know, 2001, 2003 sessions uh, that yet tech, you know, it was the, the, the backlash from the public was loud and vociferous and it, and, and, and it creeped into political campaigns in a major way and it forced the agency and it forced policymakers to um, to recognize that and to do things differently, and um, I think the sort of the story of the Trans Texas Corridor, its demise and its potential future replacement with a parallel, a, a, a separate parallel uh, corridor to I-35, but one that it is um, driven and determined at the local level rather than the state level, is probably the biggest outcome from the what. What we saw at TechStot, the biggest mistake where we made was, which was telling people there's a problem and here's the solution. It, that, and, and I still believe the agency was right. There is a problem and it was a great solution. We didn't, we were told we didn't educate. And so now the agency has now gone back and it's been a, it's been like a four year long process of working through local segment committees to get the local folks, you know, made up the Farm Bureau, county judges, mayors, you name it, to come together, work in, through consensus to recognize, okay, yes, we need additional capacity. Where is it gonna go? And how do we communicate that and get support in our local community? So I, I, I think TechStot learned a very important lesson. Um, the good news is, I don't. Th at, the, in, in, at the end of the day, um, the TechSoft became a better agency for it, and we were still able to continue and um, deliver these projects. And, um, and and the results have been remarkable. I mean, look at the opening of State Highway 130, Second Simmons Five and Six, a couple weeks ago. Um, that was the very first comprehensive development agreement project in the state. It was developed by Centra, a foreign country, a foreign company. Um, but the opening was to great fanfare, and the only negative story so far have been the number of feral hogs on the road. I mean, it's a great, it's a great road. It's the most high-tech piece of payment in the world. And, and for that, the state was given $125 million for a road that would not exist today had it not been for this really innovative tool. But it took a lot of growing pains to get us to that point. Um, Thankfully, the legislature stuck with the agency. We, we had to take a few lumps, um, but we're then now we're using those tools to apply it uh, in the Metroplex and two big projects that are going on. Uh, well, actually three CDA projects, but only two of them are concession up in the Metroplex. So, um, so I think on terms of sort of the innovative financing side of transportation, uh, TechStot has learned a lesson. We're probably ahead of the power curve on how to deal with those issues. Um, in terms of new sources of funding for transportation, whether it's an increase in the gas tax or indexing the gas tax or new registration fees or scrapping the gas tax altogether and going to a vehicle's mile travel system for a stable, that what, what transportation needs and what TxDOT needs is a stable, reliable source of funding for transportation. The gas tax is none of those things. Um, we have not lost gas tax revenues because our population is a hedge against the, 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 lo the loss of, of the uh, in the gas tax. So, um, you know, that to me is the big unknown with this legislature. Are they going to embrace increased fees through a gas tax or in increased registration fees? I, I don't know. Um, they haven't historically been. And that's why I, during my tenure at TxDOT, I embraced very strongly these different sources of financing for transportation. That wasn't always very popular, but it has allowed us to continue to move forward in Texas. And you know, and, and I, I, I don't know. I like to think that maybe that it's a model that can be used for water. I, I don't know. Maybe perhaps. Um, um, but um, so I think there's there's two ways. There's two sources of funding that you need to look at for transportation. How the public reacts to. New sources of fees and revenues. I, I, I don't know where they are right now on that. I want to come back to that with all of you. What do you, what, what do you think, Robert, in terms of you know this this question in regard to education? Well, I think most folks look to their local school districts for you know how they feel about what's going on in education, um, and that you've got a complicated message now because of six different school finance lawsuits that are going on. So. And you're, you're speaking to a large and growing number of households that don't have school-aged children. And so I could make a statement that, gosh, you know, the Student Success Initiative really wasn't funded at a certain level. 
And what I was talking about in the scheme of things was a rounding error in the state budget. That was just you know, a reallocation of resources to what I thought was a, a critical deed. But the backlash that you saw was, oh, here comes TEA just asking for billions of more dollars. But in, in the scheme of things, it was far, far less. But it was something I thought we needed to focus on. So anytime you talk about that, you see this, the, the division. Uh, there's some bright spots. You're starting to see um, public interest in education. Look what happened on the election in San Antonio, pre-K for SA. I mean, I, you know, I, I was one of the people who was going, you know, I don't know if a lot of folks are going to vote for an eight, uh, one eight cent tax increase for pre-K, but sure enough, it passed. So you see interest out there in continuing to support public ed. Um, that and, you know, uh, tax rollback elections passing, bond issues passing. So you, you see that support out there, but it's, you're speaking to a, a far more complex audience than you traditionally have in the past with, without school age kids. Well, let me, I kind of want to then come back down, but since you raised that, how do you read the fiscal environment right now? I mean, I think, and the mood in terms of revenue, it's come up one way or the other in, everybody, in everybody's answer. Um, clearly, the last couple of cycles, um, with budget pacts, with you know fiscal, you know a mood of fiscal crisis in the nation, you know less pronounced but certainly present in the state. How do you read that? Is is it changing? And is it kind of inevitable that we reach a tipping point in your area? I mean, education is I think where we're talking about it front and center as people talk again and again about the short about the reduction in per pupil spending last time, what the impact is, how much people are going to notice that. Is this now the new normal or do we think it's do we think it's swinging? Oh, I think, you know, anytime you talk about Texas, you have to look at a context with the rest of the country and we're in a far a lot better shape than a lot of other states that um, significantly cut education uh, even more than Texas did. So and, and you hope that when the pendulum swings back that, that we'll be able to reallocate those resources and like I said, fund enrollment growth and, and, and perhaps even target some interventions for students who fail the test and provide what the law requires because it wasn't just me saying, hey, I think this is a good idea. It was me saying this is what I think the law requires. And, you know, and then we'll see how six different school finance lawsuits pan out. But remember last time, the courts heard three issues equity, adequacy, and an unconstitutional statewide property tax. By the time it got to the Supreme Court, the only problem that was presented to the legislature was the unconstitutional statewide property tax. They fixed it. Some, some would argue they fixed it too well um, and without giving meaningful discretion locally to raise revenue, but the question is who does meaningful discretion lie in? Is it the voters or the school board? So you, you've got all those things working, but I think the climate overall is improving and you know, hopefully we'll, we'll be able to um, take advantage of that. Let me ask you, by the climate, do you mean the economic climate or the political climate? I think the economic climate is improving. I mean, look at the sales tax receipts. I mean, what would, was, yesterday we said 5.4% uh, increase um, in sales tax receipts. So certainly that is an indication of uh, an improving and, and uh, thriving, in some cases, economy. Um, and I think on the political side, you've got, what, 49 new members of the House. Um, you've got I think seven or eight new members of the State Board of Education. I think that's the big question mark, is no one really knows. Yeah, I think some would argue that part of the, that new membership, part of the orientation of that new membership suggests that they're not really necessarily seeing it as a pendulum swing. But you, you, seem to, you seem to think that it will come back politically too? Am I reading too much well, into what, that? What I was talking about last year was the pendulum swinging on standardized tests. You know, when the House votes 138 to 2 to ban testing for two years, I thought I was just simply stating the obvious. You know, there's a backlash coming. Let's prepare for it because I didn't want to lose a system that I thought helped kids. You know, but I thought that we were overemphasizing it. Even if we weren't overemphasizing it at the state level, the interpretation out in the school district was that's all we cared about, so that's all they did was benchmark testing. And that's the, when I used the dreaded P word. And I talked about you know, the system becoming a perversion. The whole focus was supposed to be on the curriculum, not just the test. Anybody who was in those meetings back in the mid-90s when we were developing the accountability system, we were 100% convinced that we were going to focus on the curriculum and not just the test. And so that's what I was talking about. The education report at the Tribune will strangle me if I don't follow up on that. So what do you think went wrong there? You know, I think it was a combination of we, as I said, doubled down on the test every couple of years. And then the interpretation out there was that that's all we cared about. That's all the ratings were going to be based on. And what I was talking about was an accountability system that looked at every other day and what does a good career and tech program look like and what does a good fine arts program. And I was hoping that we could kind of take the blinders that focused only on the test and kind of give some breadth and, and 
you know, depth to understanding what's really going on in our schools. But, you know, we just, we got to a point that I think the agency did a very good job of trying to get information out there about STAR and of course, but it was never enough. The only thing that would have worked is if we'd have been able to release a test. You know, and that's kind of what we were getting is, you know, we, we had reams of information and, and I think it was just short of us being able to release a, a practice test that drove everybody crazy. Is there a legislative remedy to that? Well, I, you know, I, there is a law in Chapter 39 that says districts cannot benchmark tests more than 10% of the instructional days. But I think in many cases that's probably not being enforced. Um, uh, or not, not, maybe it's not known. Um, so, you know, there were precautions put in place in statute to try to prevent that. Um, I, I think just, like I said, the system disaggregation of data is essential. We need to keep that, keep focus on our subgroups. Um, but take a look at, you know, some of the high stakes. Um, and, you know, the 15% thing, you know, last year we had, what, over 120 members of the House wrote me a letter saying, please get rid of this this year, it's driving our parents crazy. So I think those things are just a logical conversation that we could have moving in about accountability and assessment as we move forward. You implied that, you didn't even, you didn't even imply to you, you said that, you know, you were happy with the fact that you had introduced, you know, sort of new, you had been part of introducing new funding mechanisms at TechStot. Uh, same question to you, is that gonna have to be the permanent solution? Do you think the fiscal climate is such that you know, there's never gonna be a, well, a climate you, where you can create new revenue mechanisms yeah, directly I mean, from you, government? You gotta keep in mind, I mean, we're, transportation is such an odd duck funding issue because you know, I don't care about GR, how much GR we have or don't have because we're not relying on GR. Our GR is a very small part of our budget, um, although significant in some of our bonding programs. Um, as a result, and I have gigged other former commissioners in the past about this, where other areas might have been getting cut, transportation last session actually increased funding. So, you know, we were, we were pretty happy about that. Um, I think the bigger issue is the overall policy about how you fund transportation. Uh, it's not so much how much money is available in general revenue, but is, we know the gas tax is broken. What are we gonna replace it with? So to me, it's less, it, I mean, obviously that is a fiscal conversation, but it's more of a policy conversation of, are we ready to scrap the gas tax and go to something that's more directly measures use of roads, um, like a vehicle miles travel uh, system would, which frankly scares a lot of people. Um, do we go, do we increase registration fees, driver's license fees, index the gas tax, things like that. And those are larger policy discussions that really haven't been had at the state level and they've, they've been largely masked by the fact that we have focused on these sort of innovative financing uh, techniques for transportation and a lot of the members of the legislature have been critical of that. They think that, you know, increased reliance on tolling and bonding has just sort of has um, uh, essentially uh, put us back in having the conversation about the permanent, long-term, uh, dependable source of funding for transportation. Um, it, it has to happen, it's not the gas tax. But as close as you are to the political process, it seems to me you're a good person to ask though that, you know, as you, as you sort of imply there, as soon as you start talking about new funding mechanisms, it seems like there has become a much more stringent test for talking about new sources of revenue. So I guess my question to you is, do you think that'll change? I mean, you sound like you hope it will, but I'm love, wondering if you think right, it will what, or not. What, what I would love to see happen for transportation is if a solution can be found that replaces the gas taxes, the gas tax today on a dollar for dollar basis, but with something that grows with the population and grows over time, the gas tax doesn't. The gas tax is just stagnant even though our population is growing. Uh, the only reason why it is stagnant is because our population is growing. So um, I'm hopeful maybe that can be a policy solution for a legislature that has very real political concerns about raising taxes to say, you know, we didn't, we didn't raise your transportation taxes, but, but it was replaced with something that's going to grow over time and be something that transportation planners can rely on that, to meet the needs of a growing state. Tom, it seems like that argument is a, it's another version of the argument you talked about with water with a, a marginal tap fee. I'm wondering if you see, you know, any, you know, that the restrictiveness of that environment easing up at all. Um, I think it might. I'm not terribly optimistic about that. I, I don't see a taxes being raised for water. I just don't. Um, I think that, that the likelihood of, of a very modest tap fee, uh, if there was enough education 
statewide as well as uh, uh, within the Capitol. Um, I think that might happen. I've heard talk about tapping the rainy day fund for uh, sort of the, the kernel of some funding that could be distributed by the Water Development Board for really needy projects uh, on a high priority basis. I'm not terribly optimistic about that, but I'm hearing more and more discussions of it. And the good news about that is at least there are people talking about possible sources of revenue because a couple of sessions ago, you really didn't hear a lot. Uh, the, the bottled water fee was, was raised um, some years back and has come up repeatedly, but uh, you know, the association doesn't want to be targeted, and um, I, I'm not really optimistic about that one either. Um, I think you're going to see a push on public-private partnerships as a way to, similar to transportation, to leverage really limited dollars, at least on the front end, so that uh, local governments perhaps can get water projects funded uh, for their region uh, on a priority basis. But again, if you want to kickstart some of that, if you want to help from a statewide level, it's going to take some sort of funding. And I think, uh, if not this session, then perhaps the next, that there will be some sort of non-tax revenue source that has a decent chance of passing. Uh, to me, uh, the, the the tap fee, because it's so widespread and it could be such a small amount on your bill, um, seems like a good approach. Chairman Ritter has talked about it a lot in his different conversations at water conferences and so forth, but uh, the proof will be in the pudding. We'll see. The rainy day fund is a really unfortunate name know, for you, isn't it? I know. It? It's, <laughs> it, it, we don't have a drought fund, so. <laughs> oh, what do you think in terms of HHS? Obviously, Medicaid, Medicare, huge, but you know the discussion of this is very complicated. This morning, Evan did the conversation with Kirk Watson, uh, with Senators Watson um, and um, and Senator Patrick. I'm blanking out Senator Patrick's name. Senator Patrick was pretty definite, I think, in saying that you know, HHS and, and funding on Medicaid and Medicare and social services was going to basically break the state if we didn't, and it, if we didn't do something, you know, drastically different. And then, in fact, he drew a direct parallel saying that it was coming at the expense of education. Um, is that an inevitable kind of formulation? Well, I, I think that certainly is the major concern that many members of the legislature have, and that is that the uh, required or mandatory funding for health and human services crowds out uh, the funding opportunities for other areas of government, particularly public education. And uh, one of the uh, most difficult things that people would say to me when I served as commissioner was that uh, Medicaid uh, is unsustainable. And um, I mean, I could not really disagree with them, but I didn't really have <laughs> anything to offer them. Uh, with that re in that regard, um, you know, and so I think the focus then will continue to be on when you talk about alternative revenue sources in, in health and human services, typically that means, well, is, is there a, a way to get some additional federal funds, which, and, you know, federal funds are not free, but, you know, they, they come to our government and uh, we should, we should uh, seek them and apply them appropriately. And so there's always efforts to maximize uh, federal funding. And so that's one, uh, that's one option that's available. And, and the uh, other side of it is always, how can you deliver uh, the same level of services at a lower cost? And so a lot of focus on cost containment efforts. Um, you know, is there, is there um, uh, a less costly, uh, equally effective way to provide medical services to those in need. And, and so you try to balance those two things out. Uh, but it's, it continues to be a, a huge fiscal challenge. And for the state, you know, Health and Human Services represents about, oh, I, I guess a third of, of uh, all state spending. But when you start looking at the discretionary general revenue uh, that the legislature has available to allocate it, it, um, it continues to uh, require a huge chunk of that. And, and uh, limits their ability to respond to other policy needs. I want to ask you about something that I suspect you're thankful to not be in the middle of, but that's in your domain of this conversation, and that's the, the ongoing transition or possible transition in the women's health care program. Oh, yes. How do, you, how do you read that conflict, and what do you, 
How do you make sense of what's going on with there? Is that is this a discussion that's driven primarily by politics around Planned Parenthood? Is there a legitimate kind of policy domain question in well, here? Could, what do you, you make could, of it? You could talk about it or think about it in terms of politics, but politics means that you know they're reflecting um, their beliefs, their their philosophy, um, the principles upon which they were elected to the legislature uh, on either side of the issue. And so I think uh, the uh, political process then balances out those uh, competing views and, and priorities. I mean, I think right now it's so confusing to everybody because of the back and forth in, in court, uh, whether it's federal court or state court. And so I've lost track of where it is. I think, uh, I think it's back in state court now, and there's a temporary restraining order, so everything is OK, and the federal funds are still flowing. At some point, there, it will come to a resolution. And, uh, and I think the political process is the, uh, is the mechanism we have to resolve those kinds of conflicts. And so again, I think what um, the Health and Human Services Commission has done is put in place the decisions of the legislature from the last session. Uh, the governor's been very clear about what his uh, beliefs and position is, uh, and the legislature has concurred. And so, um, back again next session and see if that's reaffirmed. I might even have thought you were still in office. <laughs> um, let, let, me, let me ask you another, then a follow-up question. Uh, do you think, based on your experience and allowing for the fact you haven't been in office for a little bit, do you think the state has the capacity to deliver to continue delivering the kind of services that have been delivered if Planned Parenthood is cut out of the equation? Well, I, I think there are enough resources available and enough other providers. I mean, the Planned Parenthood has been um, a, a large, willing provider, and the program has made, uh, been accessible to a lot of women, uh, and they're familiar with that. That doesn't mean that there aren't other providers. And I think I've seen something from the commission that indicates they've, they've identified 3,000 additional providers. Now, um, the issue I don't know really uh, is, is based around the program structure. The, uh, I, I think it's really more around the uh, philosophical disagreement and whether or not the state should exclude that provider uh, as a matter of choice. I mean, and, and um, you know, I know the arguments go to, to all of these other operational points and, uh, and the financing points. And yeah, it, it does. It is nice to get 90% federal match. Uh, but you know, when you're talking about $40 million and a $25 billion Medicaid budget, I don't know that that's the basis that the decision will be made upon. And so it really is, it really is more of a, uh, ideological, philosophical, uh, disagreement. And, and I think that's what the elected officials are in office to determine. Well, this goes back, this goes back to the first question I asked a little bit, just one more, just once more on that beat. Now that the national question, the national election has taken place. The Obama administration is not going anywhere. Uh, Attorney General Abbott kind of famously tweeted the morning of the election, something to the effect of, you know, when Romney wins today, we'll be able to drop all these lawsuits and not have to pay for them anymore. Well, that's obviously not gonna happen. I mean, aside from the, the financial incentive, do you think that Having the administration in place for four years may help alleviate this. I mean, you've worked from both the federal yeah. and the state level. No, I, I, I mean, when it comes to the women's health program in, in particular, I don't, I don't think the um, the federal government is uh, is open to changing their their interpretation and their position. And uh, so I, I, I think, I think the lines are drawn on that. And I was, I was thinking back. I, I was commissioner when the program was first implemented. And the uh, prohibition uh, was, in, was in law at that time, and, and uh, it did uh, revolve around uh, the meaning of affiliate. The, uh, the definition of affiliate that uh, we applied focused more on whether or not there was a business or a financial relationship uh, that existed between uh, a business entity that performed abortion and a business entity that did not perform abortion. And I think, um, you know, following the implementation on that basis, the legislature came back around and, um, and I was no longer commissioner, but made a determination. That's not, that's not really what we meant uh, by that restriction. We meant for it to be more broadly applied. And, um, and so 
they're the ones that are in place to make those kind of decisions. And so I, I think that's the position uh, that will be maintained. I don't see that uh, the Centers for Medicaid Medicare Services uh, are too open to changing their interpretation about it either. So it may wind back up in federal court again. Okay, I want, I want you all to be thinking about questions. I want to ask you guys one quick lightning round based on this discussion while people are, are charting questions out. In the domains we've talked about as we go in, as we go into the legislature, are you optimistic or pessimistic about, pro about progress being made in the areas where you guys have so previously served? I've been leaning on you, so we'll start with Robert on the other end. Uh, cautiously optimistic. Optimistic. Cautiously optimistic. I'm neutral. I mean, I, I think when it comes to health and human services, um, you know, progress, I mean, I, I, maybe, maybe the outcome would be to hold our own. Well, nobody's negative. Yeah, right. <laughs> okay, so Laura's going to have a microphone, and we're going to open it to the floor for questions. Mr. Theobald. Again, if, just to remind you, please wait for the microphone. It would be helpful. Thank you. Hi, all. Thanks for coming. Uh, this one's for you, Mr. Hawkins. Uh, the expansion of Medicaid, Medicare, uh, I'm not too familiar with it, but if I understand it correctly, if the state decides to not do it themselves, the federal government's going to do it anyway. Uh, is that correct? And if so, wouldn't the state want uh, to have control over that? And so do you think that uh, they'll go ahead and, and accept that's, those? That's ones? not the case. Um, uh, when you deal, when you look at the Medicaid expansion, that's a that's a state determination, a state um, authorization, and so it's it's, a, it's up to the state to determine whether or not to expand Medicaid. I, on the other side of it is the uh, um, health insurance exchange, that will take place regardless of whether or not the state uh, runs it, and so that's already being developed now. Our state has opted not to um, establish and operate the uh, health insurance exchange uh, established under federal law, and so the federal government is, uh, is uh, moving forward with that. When it comes to the Medicaid expansion of the Supreme Court ruling, uh, made clear that the state has the discretion as to whether or not to expand its Medicaid program. Another question? Gentleman over here. I'm glad you're all optimistic. Um, and it's, <laughs> well, you have every reason to be. It, it would appear that when the controller releases her estimate, they'll be somewhere in the neighborhood of 10 to $12 billion. And it would seem to be that the constraint now will be the spending limit. So if you were still commissioner of education, and Albert, if you were still responsible for Medicaid, would you guys just be willing to flip a coin and split the $7 billion between you? <laughs> uh, probably not. <laughs> <laughs> I'd go for broke. I don't know, Robert might. Uh, you know, that, when we, I, I, think, I think the fiscal uh, demands are one of the r real reasons I'd be neutral about the outlook uh, for this session in Health and Human Services. And, and uh, certainly this session, Will, will be um, a lot uh, more promising and positive than the last session when, when we were um, scaling back. But just to stay even uh, with Medicaid uh, is going to take $10 billion. Um, so there was a $4.7 billion shortfall for uh, 2013. Um, have to match that amount for the 14-15 biennium and then the federal match rate has changed uh, that's going to cost state funds 600 million more and so I think just just to start off even in with Medicaid you need 10 billion I guess you're not yes yes and so then you have to start looking ahead at 1415 yes be plenty of money, I, I I take that I uh, given that, I'd, I'd, I'd split the difference. Yeah, I don't, I don't know that I would flip a coin. You know, I, I look at, you know, when I did an LAR, you know, 
what I thought were the priorities that the state needed to be focused on. And right now, that's implementing end of course exams and, and the, the subjects I mentioned earlier and enrollment growth. Um, you know, that's, you know, a couple of billion dollars each biennium, you know, just for enrollment growth. Plus, looking at the cuts that were made last time and seeing if you want to restore some of those. Um, and then getting into, as I said, implementation of end of course exams as star. So I don't know that I, I could get $10 billion, but I'd, I'd, I'd fight him for it. <laughs> Let, let me follow up on that a, a slightly more focused way, Robert. Do you, do you think that all things being equal, it would be best to restore the cuts? In other words, say, you know, even if you stipulate the question whether you want to or not, do you think that, the, that those cuts hurt the system badly enough that you think that they need to be restored if they could be? You can never paint with that broad of a brush in a state as large and diverse as Texas. In some cases, school districts really got hurt. In some cases, they were already hurt because of local decisions that they had made for 10 or 15 years. Poor decisions about hiring and not firing compounded themselves over time. In some cases, you had districts with fund balances that were fine. So it's, it's impossible to paint with that broader brush. Money is relevant, but not dispositive. But when you get to a point, I, now I would have absolutely said that with the $10 billion they proposed cutting, that would have done some serious long-term damage. And I think that working with the legislature to get back that $6 billion prevented us from really you know, seeing mass chaos across the system. I think the system can function. It's looking ahead um, you know, for enrollment growth and the future demands of STAR and end of course that we're going to have to have some serious conversations about additional revenue. Another question from, OK, let's go over here and then over there. Thanks, Daniel. Uh, yeah. So this morning, uh, Senator Patrick and Senator Watson had, a, I would say, a very spirited conversation about the aspect of education funding. And the one thing that uh, Senator Watson was bringing out was the fact that, you know, we cut that, we need to put money back to it. Senator Patrick came back and said, well, you just don't throw money at the problem. You know, you need to go in and fix the solution. Of course, he's going back to his um, little piece of vouchers, or as he called it, school of choice. Um, so let's just say we take money off the table. What, what can we do to go in and fix the schools? I mean, what can we do to go in and, and as Senator Patrick said, address the issue? Well, I, I'm a believer that real education reform is something very similar to what Deirdre said. It, it's something you plot out and takes time. And I believe that the college and career readiness standards that we've put in place, if we properly align our instructional materials, assessments, professional development, and resources to them, will be better for kids. I think end of course exams will be better for kids. It's just how we implement them, what stakes we attach to them. I believe if we stay the course on a lot of these things, it will be better for kids. But we're going to have to have a conversation about resources in the future. Now, you know, I, you know, I don't know that there's ever a magic bullet. You know, if you go back to the late 1800s, the headlines were colleges and universities upset that kids aren't graduating ready for college. It was in the late 1800s. We're still having that debate today. So it's, it's one of those things that everything is cyclical in education. And, and the same thing with vouchers. You know, you can have a, let's have a conversation about school choice. I don't think you have an agency that's prepared to implement it. And that's going to be the devil. It's going to be in the details and implementation of that. Um, I said at the Tribune Fest, you're going to need to give the agency guns and badges. Because I worry that, you know, you'll have some fly-by-nighters open up, send the state a bill, and then be off in some non-extradition country before we know what happens. So um, you need to be very careful about how you implement it. Remember, too, the Supreme Court has ruled that the agency cannot regulate private schools, particularly home schools. So you've got that little constitutional thing coming out here again. So you've got to be thoughtful about how you think through that. I want to follow up on that a little bit. What do you anticipate? You, you have, what do you anticipate Senator Patrick doing or proposing? You know, I, I heard this morning he has a plan, but no one's seen it. So I really couldn't. I, I don't want to put words in his mouth. Uh, you know, like I said, the, the school choice voucher debate's been on the table for how many decades now? I mean. Been talking about, I mean, huh? Since uh, 99. Since 99, um, you know, um, you know, they they tried a number of avenues, a number of options. I, you know, I personally think high quality charter schools are something that that should be encouraged. And I think the bad charter schools ought to be closed more quickly. Um, but so I think that can be instructive to us in, as to how a school choice system could morph into something that we didn't intend. It was another question. Of but I couldn't see where it was. No, we're done. 
Okay, well, please thank our guests. And thank you guys very much.